I remember honestly looking at the first stuff with Ninja Turtles and being like, will they let us do this? Like, is this, it's so divergent from what the norm is. Like, is this even allowed? Will they just say no? And, and they didn't, they said, yes, go for it. I think that is an exciting opportunity as creatively the powers that be seem to have loosened their definition of what an animated film looks like. Welcome to the Hollywood Reporter's Animation Roundtable. I'm Carolyn Jardina. Let's meet our guests. Hello, my name is Peter Sohn, the director of Elemental. Hi, my name is Spawn Verson Thorne, one of the directors of Witch. Hi, I'm Kent Powers, and I'm one of the directors of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Uh, hi, I'm Seth Rogen, and I'm one of the writers, producers, and uh, I play uh, Bebop in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. Hi, I'm Karen Ryan, one of the producers of Nimona. Hi, I'm Benjamin Renner, uh, director of Migration. So a number of you are also writers. So I'd like to start by asking all of you, what do you look for in a story? And are there types of stories that you'd like to see more of? Who else wrote their thing? Go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, it's all about these little seeds of potential that tickle parts of your body. You know, like if it's, if the idea hits you in the heart in a way that, you know, resonates, you know, that that's great. But then if it's also making you, sort of laugh and giggle, uh, just thinking about the idea that starts to add on top of that pile of, is this gonna be something? And then, you know, the, that, those seeds of, of, of who these characters are, uh, if, if they somehow sort of get under your skin in, you know, uh, you know in, 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 in this sort of animation way where like, oh, wow, I'd love to play with these characters and see where they go. That really starts the, the, the ball rolling for me. I think for me, I love the story that let me ponder about my own life and existence you know it's great to put yourself in those characters and for me I love the medium of animation and that allow us to go beyond the existence of reality and I really love going to the the fantastical places yeah I mean I, I really love being surprised man like it's one of those things where I think not just as artists I think fans are so savvy Everyone has a really good understanding of story structure. So when you hear a story and you go like, oh, I didn't see that coming. Um, that's always something that makes me perk up a lot. But I think at a base level, it's honestly just characters that I find interesting. You know, just characters that I'm like, OK, I want to spend a little bit of time with these characters. Yeah, I look for uh, relatable, uh, relatability and uh, authenticity. Um, you know, I've seen over the years, we've made some movies that have really stood the test of time for decades and and the reason is that people still see themselves in the characters and see themselves in the struggles and and relate to the the stories and the conflicts and the desires of the characters um so yeah with this movie for example like the idea of like teenagers wanting to be accepted and feel normal like would not resonate with me more and feel more kind of uh basic and simple but at the same time is a great jumping off point for like insane world building you know uh, I agree with what everybody said so far. And for me specifically, it's the characters that attracts me to the story. With Nimona, Nimona is this character that I had never seen before on screen. And you asked us what stories excite us and what we want to see more of. And I want to see more stories where people see themselves on screen. And I think everybody on this screen agrees with that. And everybody's movies does a good job of bringing that forward. For us, Nimona was this character who, this strong female character, and I've worked on films like that before, but for the first time, she wasn't on this journey of self-discovery. She liked who she was to begin with. And her, like, she's this incredibly powerful character, but she just wants to be seen for who she is. And I think that's so tragic and so relatable and something that everybody can see and like put themselves into the story. So more stories like that, more stories that represent the audience in a more authentic and true way. Now, Karen, uh, Nimona had a really interesting start. Um, you began at Blue Sky when um, Blue Sky was part of Fox. And then after the Disney acquisition and Blue Sky was closed, the project was uh, almost didn't happen. Um, would you tell us the, the journey of the project in order to get it made? We went through a lot on Nimona. Nimona was a passion project that took us, we were pushing for this movie for years in an industry that was pushing back on us and telling us the world wasn't ready for the story and that we weren't, we were a risk. And uh, we're not, this movie, the reception that we're getting now is just proof of it. This movie is a universal story. It's about a character who just wants to be accepted for who they are. And I think 
it's funny because the pushback we got from the industry is also kind of the reason I think we persevered and survived. We were making the film with Blue Sky, as you all know, and uh, we had, we'd finally broken the story, which is something that's really difficult to do in this industry and takes a long time. We were supposed to screen the movie on a Thursday, and we got the call on that Tuesday before that the studio was closing, and with it, the movie was canceled. So from there, it was it was a heartbreaking. But in that same conversation, we just we decided what else can we do? How do we keep going? Um, so we became an independent film overnight and we took the reels and shopped it around the industry and showed people. And uh, Megan Allison at Annapurna saw them and came to us immediately and said that she saw herself in the movie and was willing to help us get it done. So we did it. We just we never stopped. We never, we never stopped pushing for this. And the movie pivoted to an independent film. We figured out how to do that. We had to build our own little studio and start making phone calls and calling all our friends. Uh, if you've seen the movie, our credits are over 14 and a half minutes long. So there's pretty much no one in this industry who wasn't part of this movie. And I think that's a testament to what the movie means. Like it's about something. People see themselves in it. And so we were, we were pushed back by the industry, but the animation community stepped in and pushed with us and helped us bring this movie to the screen. Now I'm bummed that I wasn't in your credits. I mean, you know, Pete Sohn is in Spider-Verse. He, he voices one of our characters, so, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it, was, it was heartbreaking, Karen. I remember uh, getting to see the, the, one of the latest versions of the reels of it, and it blew all of us away. And then um, so many, uh, when the, the studio shut down, so many of the animators and story folks came to Pixar and uh, we were all sharing in the love for that the last reels that we had seen. And so when it finally got picked up again, it was, yeah, it was a full animation community love for it. That um, just very, very cool. Yeah, this has been, this was the first time I've worked outside of a major studio. So it felt so small, but at the same time, like there's people everywhere in all corners of this industry who are, who worked on this and helped us make this happen. So it's been this like very communal experience. I love it. Steph, why don't you tell us about the, um, what was behind relaunching the turtles? I grew up with Ninja Turtles. You know, I, they came out when I was uh, a child, the, the animated series came out when I was six, I think, and the toys around then. And they just really captured my imagination. And, um, and I loved them and especially the toys, honestly, there was so much detail in them and there was so much like put into them, so much storytelling. Um, and then it was something that me and my uh, partner, Evan, were always just fascinated by. But what we always gravitated to was the teenage part. And it was like a joke, I would say, anecdotally. It's like, weirdly, I always find the teenage part of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to kind of be the most compelling word in that jumble of crazy words you have, you know? Um, and it was always the part that was underserved, it felt like, in other versions of the film. They always had grown adults um, as the Ninja Turtles. So our whole idea was like, what if we really make a teenage movie and capture teenage energy in a way that I had not seen captured in like an animated film before? And that idea became really exciting and this idea of casting actual teenagers and actually putting them together in a room and allowing them simultaneously to talk and use their own words and argue and improvise and um and and really you use the language that kids use and use references that they use and allow them to play off of each other in a way that felt to me like as authentic as anything I've ever seen and then to put that into animation, which is highly rigid, you know, like every frame is concocted, you know? And so to me, this idea of blending what I consider like my strength, which is like incredibly naturalistic, improvisational based comedy into, a, you know, a, a medium that I've been in so many of these movies, I've never even met half these people that I'm in them with. And so to bring, you know, this new kind of way of this new energy of, of recording in this kind of chaotic way that is much more representative of how we make our films, our live action films. To me, that idea, like once I had it in my head, I like couldn't shake it. And if we could bring that to life, and, and I was always like, if you do that, if within five seconds, the audience sees them as just teenagers and not turtles, then like we can make a really great movie that has a lot of 
a lot more emotional resonance and relatability than I think anyone would expect from a movie called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. And so, uh, yeah, that was really, to me, what was thrilling was this, this kind of harnessing of this like chaotic energy and, and turning it into what could not be a more considered, <laughs> um, you know, poured over product, but then with the illusion that it just is kind of happening and, 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 and this kind of ramshackle, uh, you know, result that is actually the result of thousands of people working meticulously to construct it, you know? Um, so yeah, that was, Weirdly, yeah, for me, it was like a tonal result I was chasing um, uh, in a lot of ways. Well, I just have to say for that energy that you captured, Seth, uh, my family and I, we have been yelling at each other about lob it up, lob it up, lob it up, lob it up. <laughs> it's an, in, that, that sort of electricity being captured is something that I've just always loved in animation, that it's this thing that I don't know if audiences really get is that you are frame by frame trying to recreate electricity in a bottle, uh, but uh, in this sort of slow paint drying sort of manner. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. And one where you are generally not like, I, I think I'm in 20s animated movies. I have, I don't think ever been in the same room as the people I've recorded with once when the Simpsons do it like that. And that was actually, but they don't improvise. They just do it like that. So it's fast, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> But the the idea of, yeah, like the idea of being able to improvise with the people we were with, that was, it, that to me was, and seeing the kids do it. It was funny, they'd be in the kitchen talking between takes and they'd be arguing over the snacks and shoving each other. And I always like, that's what we need. Like what they're doing yeah. in the kitchen. They got to bring the kitchen into the studio. Like we need the, the kitchen talk, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and just like lower, lower a boom mic into the kitchen, right? Exactly. Literally. Yeah. And, and like, I'm sure, I mean, it's so hard to record four people at the same time. Like they're <laughs> set up for it. And, and, and we'd go from studio to studio and they'd yeah. build new rigs. There'd be more rugs and more, plexiglass <laughs> it was just like every time a new contraption but um and they had to see each other we tried it like we tried it that they were on screen like it was like unless they were like face to face able to like <laughs> lay into one another it just didn't really work so yeah it was it was a lot of trial and error <laughs> just to riff off of that idea of electricity i mean you know if we are doing a love story you know this idea of what a fire fell in love with water and so much of that the idea requires chemistry, requires the belief that these two characters that are, you know, seemingly opposite have some sort of electrical connection with each other. And, uh, uh, you know, having them in separate rooms, you know, could you, could you essentially fake it? You know, uh, you know, the, I love being in an audience in a theater with a lot of people because there is a palpable chemistry that happens when someone's when the audience is laughing or crying at something. And, uh, you know, the, the times where we were recording with uh, Leah or uh, Lewis, who plays Ember, our, our fire character, and trying to get her to a place where she's beginning to fall in love with Wade, who played by Mamadou Ache, the, the, this, the times where we've recorded them and then put those two voices, you know, together. Again, like what Seth is saying, like, I don't know if everyone knows that they're re recorded separately in these closets. And then you are bringing these digital information of voices together in an e editing uh, bay and then listening to it to see if that feels real or or does it feel like that electricity that you're looking for. And uh, there are a lot of tricks uh, uh, that you learn throughout the years to try to capture that. And then ultimately you go, screw it, let's let's bring them in a room, you know? And, uh, but you know, the, the, the process takes so long you can't do that, you know, for seven years. No. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we tried both. I mean, sometimes it was effective, sometimes it wasn't. I mean, we found that people in the same room, for us, oddly enough, worked the best when it was um, dramatic emotional moments, like um, George, Stacy, and Gwen. So putting Haley um, Steinfeld and Shea Wiggum in the room together for that like father daughter really emotional moment, that actually was what cracked open that scene. So it was actually more the the dramatic because, you know, we have actually quite a few kind of dramatic um, moments in our film. And those were the times that it seemed like putting them together um, worked a bit better. Oddly enough, the comedy stuff, you know, part of it was like where they're scene partners. You know, Daniel Kaluuya, for example, you know, he has a really great improv background that a lot of people don't know about. 
So a lot of times it was just like, he's pretending I'm Miles. And it actually kind of started hurting my feelings because he'd be like making jokes about Miles. And I'm like, this dude doesn't like me. And he's like, no, he's, he's in character. Like he's, he's making fun of Miles. And I'm like, no, it feels personal. But then it turns out it wasn't. He was, he's just a really good improv actor um, and, and it's spliced in a lot better. But it is interesting listening to these, these guys speak because I'm like, oh, we did it more for the emotional um, beats. It also, some people are, are like VO veterans, but we also had a lot of first time VO people on our film. Like Shea Wiggum had never done voiceover before. So I think that was actually beneficial for his character because he had a lot of questions. <laughs> he came in and was like, okay, let's talk. Why would I do this? And we'd have these long, deep character discussions that actually would help reveal some of the holes in our character development and storytelling. And we're kind of like, you know, you'd, I'd look over at Phil or look over at Chris and be like, you know, that's a good point. And we would just kind of rewrite in the booth, <laughs> do, do, do quite, a, quite a bit of that. Because, um, but yeah, it, 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 it took all kinds of things to come together for, for these vocal performances. I wish people could appreciate the vocal performances and animation more because the, the, one of the big problems with this medium that I've seen doing animation and live action, people don't know what they're looking at on the screen. You know, it's like they don't understand that that shot is a VFX shot. They don't like, people don't actually kind of grasp sometimes just how um, incredible um, technologically, performance-wise, what they're seeing up there is because when we do our jobs well, you kind of don't notice. You just kind of go along with the story. I also feel like sometimes animation gets a reputation where it's it's a different kind of acting, where it's like an almost easier in a way, and I think that's completely the opposite because you have these characters. We weren't able to record any of our actors together. It was a scheduling problem, and we had six years to try and make it happen, and we we couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But feel that on the screen you feel a real chemistry between them especially chloe grace moret she's our nimona and riz ahmed who's Ballister. they never met they finally met after filming was over at some other place but the level of talent that these actors have to have to be able to convince you and to get into these emotional moments and these funny moments alone in a booth and they usually only have like us one of the directors or producers sitting there trying to act across from them and they can still bring it and they can make these characters real for us, we found that was casting people who connected to the journeys of the characters and really saw themselves in it and could just turn it on and be there. And I'm impressed every time. Animation is a crazy process and people who can bring their art to it, beautiful. I, I found that some people people thought that animation, you just write a script and then you record it and then you draw it and then you animate it. And that's not the process of it at all, right? You have to first draft, you meet the actors. We met Ariana and we were like, oh, you know, initially Asha was a determined character. She loves her family and her people. But what Ariana brought to the table is this sense of joyous personality while also being driven. And if you know her in real life, someone who is so passionate about her community and she speaks up about them, right? We're like, oh, that that part of the character give Asha uh, a new dimension that we didn't think of before. And both Ariana and Chris Pine <laughs> ask really smart smart questions about their characters, which make us think like, oh, we thought we knew the answer. We do not. So we will we will work harder on that and let's work together. And they dive into the motivation behind each character. We we keep writing um, a new statement of what drives Magnifico, because this is a character where we know we want to make a, bring back like a classic Disney villain, but we want to give a new twist of someone who you see on screen the descent into that villainy. So he's not just showing up like Jafar already, like, ho, 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 I'm going to, you know, take the power. We want to give um, Magnifico depth. And Chris Pine worked a lot with us on that. And he's so smart. He just see right through. Sometimes you're like in the in the deadline, you just, you know, write, writing some stuff. And then he was like, nope, I'm not buying that. And I'm like, you're right. Thank you for saying that. We're going to work together on those. And, and he has such beautiful range from charming, powerful, crazy villain. And then who knew he can sing, right? We actually Google that if Chris Pine singing. So that's what we're talking <laughs> That guy can do everything. Yes. <laughs> I have a photo with me and Chris Pine from like eight years ago and it haunts me to this day. No one should ever have to take a photo next to Chris Pine. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a horrific before and after picture. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I, I want to give a lot of props to our editor also, because in animation, people, you know, we did not record our actors together either. 
and all the spontaneity is happening in the editing room of people talking over each other in a way that sounds organic, that's that's our editor. So um, Benjamin, you're a um, France-based uh, cartoonist and animator. And uh, the first time you and I talked was when you made uh, 2012's Ernest and Celestine, which was released by yeah. G Kids in the US. Uh, and yeah. you were an Academy Award nomination for that movie. Um, and during that season, you met uh, Chris Maladondri of Illumination. And now this year, you have your first movie from Illumination coming out, which is Migration. Um, would you tell us a little bit about, well, for, first of all, what was it like transitioning from, uh, you know, the independent world to the studio world? What were, you know, some of the things that you learned along the way? Oh, it was, uh, uh, <laughs> to describe that in a few words, uh, it was a little bit stressful, but the, the thing is, um, I was very confused by the fact that Chris Maydandry was reaching out to me uh, in the sense that, I, you know, I knew elimination and I was like, I don't know how to do that. You know, I can do my little drawings on my side and everything, but but doing an elimination movie, that's not my thing. Not, not that I didn't like it, but just, you know, like it's, it's too huge and I can't handle this kind of thing. And and I thought there was a misunderstanding, like he thought I was someone else or something like that. I went to the meeting because I wanted to be polite and everything, but... but um, he started pitching me the project and I, I, I really connected with what he wanted to tell through this story. It was his idea, like he, he just saw an article about like ducks being lazy now because global warming is making everything hotter. So they don't feel the need, the, the mallards, they don't feel the needs to move, you know, for migration because they, it's hot enough in their pond. So they don't move anymore. So they become lazy and, and get, you know, like stuck in routine. And he started like thinking about himself as a man with his wife and, you know, like how he has his routine and he's afraid of like getting out of his comfort zone and everything. And we talked about, you know, like those very relatable things through in our family or, or stuff like that. And I was immediately like, you know, like charmed by, by the promise of what we could do with that. And I just warned him, I have no idea how to do your kind of movies. I can help and I will do my best to help. But honestly, if, if it's not working, you just tell me, yeah, I won't be offended, you know, the studio is in Paris, I will just go back home and I will keep doing my little graphic novels and that's good for me. And uh, and we started like that and and uh, hopefully, you know, like things went okay and, and we started working together and, and we got along and, and, and I always tried to do my best, you know, with this sort of like, I was almost reassured to feel that if he was not happy, he could fire me anytime. And, that, you know, that was not something that was polite to work with me. But the thing also I love with working with Hollywood, I knew that they would fire me if they didn't like me. Anyway. So, so <laughs> I, I was reassured by that. Yeah, that's a sort of like relief. You know, I'm not being here because I'm, a, I'm an imposter or something like that. Well, as of this recording, the movie is not out yet, but um, yeah. it's, again, the story of a family of mallards, and uh, you created the story with um, Mike White from The White Lotus. Um, how did that come to be? Uh, it, he wrote the story um, before I arrived on the project. He had the script done that he was working on for one year. And when I arrived, so the script was done and we just met for a few meetings and we got along really well, but he had to go to Survivor, you know, like the TV show, he had to be, you know, like be in it. And, and so we knew he was leaving and we felt like he was going to leave for two weeks or three weeks or something like that. And two months later, we were sort of like, what's happening? Like, where, where is he? He was actually- he did really well. A finalist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did really well. And, uh, and he came back and he had to do the White Lotus. So we didn't have much interaction. And the way Chris works, it's very empiric, you know, like his way of writing a story. He likes to anyone, not anyone, but, you know, like people to sort of like come with new ideas and, you know, like if we can do something differently, we can suggest it and see how it plays. And and so he offered me and the screenwriter who, who came in a reinforcement to bring new ideas. So that's how I sort of like, he gave me the chance of expressing myself, you know, like through my storyboards, because I don't write, I, I'm really bad at writing, you know, like with words. So I just write with drawings. And I was really amazed of having the chance to, you know, like even offer dialogues and stuff like that. The main dialogues that stayed in the movie, I learned later that it was uh, Gwen's dialogue. Gwen is a little seven years old kid. And, and I, I was very honored that some of my lines, you know, I'm French and I thought, oh, I can write for English people. And I learned after that actually Gwen was doing a lot of English mistakes and it, it was cute, but they didn't tell me it was mistakes. You know, it was just like <laughs> me ba writing back. So I have a level of a seven years old, you know, a kid for English. So I think that's good for movies with seven years old kid but but yeah no, so that was a very you know I was very honored to have a chance to you know like have a chance to write a little bit on on such a huge scale project Mikey was very nice I mean he was very very open like and it, it's great because it's the kind of person where you have to sort of like really 
I mean, I, I like to convince people, you know, like to really, if I have a point, you know, I really want to make sure that, uh, like if you, someone tells me, oh, it's not working because of this, I like to sort of argue against and, and everything. And he's really open to that, like really, you know, he likes to be convinced. And so that was really great. So we could have a chance to have conversation. But I mean, it was great. And at the end of the project, he came back and sort of like, uh, just told me, oh, that's good. And I was so relieved, you know, I just, especially after the White Lotus and everything, I was sort of like, wait, well, we changed a little thing left and right. So I hope you're happy. And he was delighted. So I was uh, relieved. No, no plans to add, put Jennifer Coolidge in migration. <laughs> oh, I wish. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, no, to be honest, uh, Jennifer Coolidge could have made a, a good heron. There was a very uh, nice heron in the movie. But but to be honest, Carol Kane was so over the top that I was delighted to have a chance to work with her. That was, yeah. And she speaks French, which was great. Like she speaks fluent French, uh, Carol Kane. So that was such a relief. That is a crazy production issue, though. Did any of your writers or you writers have to go to Survivor for several weeks and come back. <laughs> <laughs> I just Googled it. I didn't even know he was on. I was like, oh, he's been on amazing. Yeah. He's, he's, been a, he's been on a few yeah. uh, survival based game shows over the years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm waiting for Naked and Afraid, but he hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. Kemp, I have a question for you. We always talk about in animation how uh, stories are being rewritten through the production process. Um, in the case of Spider-Verse, uh, you actually just made the decision to split the movie into two parts and end on a cliffhanger. Would you tell us about how the decision came to be? Um, I mean, it was a decision that was made pretty early on. Like, I, I remember even when I came right before I came on board and, and Phil Lord and Chris Miller kind of like walked me through the the pitch for the film. And I mean, that pitch itself, I mean, there's got to be a video of it somewhere because the pitch itself is like entertaining. It's like, okay, this happens, but then this happens. Oh my God. And because of that, this happens, but then this happens and they're going and going and going. And at the end I was like, and this is one movie because it was just one of those things where even in the original concept, there was a, there was a lot there. So as soon as we got into production, it became pretty clear, like very, very early on that that it was going to have to be um, two films. And it wasn't as simple as just like splitting it in the middle. What that meant then was that everything had to be rebroken because, you know, you can't just split the film in the middle because then there's all this stuff that's in the, the what would now be the, the, the second film that it's not going to make sense to just get the beginning of all these parts. So you know, it, it it was quite a challenge, but I mean, have you met Phil Lord and Chris Miller? I mean, that's kind of like, they live, they live in a, in a world of chaos. So that's just kind of like what you, what you sign up, up for in, in the beginning. And, and it's actually really a great, I'm, I'm more of a, I come from like more of a dramatic writing background in theater. Um, and it was a, a really cool learning process um, just to see how they work on the comedy side and the amount of problem solving that's being done on the fly. And when I mean on the fly, I mean like through to when we were mixing, doing the sound mix at the end, like the rewriting, there would be times we would call in actors for ADR and they're like, wait, are you serious? Isn't the movie done yet? We're like, yeah, done-ish. Come back in. We need to re-record this. But there were, there were just, overall, I think we really locked down structurally what the film was going to be um, but then there were just like a thousand little bitty tweaks. Um, and I think, of course, the biggest concern was this idea of the cliffhanger. But we didn't hide the fact that it was going to be a cliffhanger. All of us are tremendous fans of films like Empire Strikes Back that like Empire Strikes Back was actually the first film that I went to. Man I grew up in Brooklyn. My first trip to a movie in Manhattan when I was a kid was to see the Empire Strikes Back. So I had no idea what was coming. Of course, that movie <laughs> ends. Luke gets his arm cut off. Darth Vader's his father. Han's frozen in carbonite. And I left the theater like, at the end of the time, people also forget, we didn't know Return of the Jedi was coming. Like, we didn't even know there was going to be a third movie. And Return Jedi came like three years later. So I remember being like traumatized out on the street in Manhattan after Empire. And it was... um using a Pixar term, it was like a core memory for me in going to the movies. And, and it's like, well, you know, we, we want to wrap up a certain part of the story, but we want to introduce some new twist that hopefully people won't see coming in the last few minutes. So that, you know, even though people feel like they're caught up, suddenly they realize that Miles is in Pottersville, you know, and the solution that we think we know suddenly isn't going to work. And that's what the, the third film is going to be. 
Um, and needless to say, um, I got a lot of texts from friends um, after opening night that were basically just WTF. But um, I think that's a sign that for the most part, it, it, it worked. This year, two of the five highest grossing movies at this point um, are animated, Spider First being one of them, but um, but many others did not fare as well. And um, there are still concerns out there that uh, the family box office and the animation box office still hasn't recovered from the pandemic. What is everyone's thoughts on this topic? Um, I don't think that's, uh, you know, <laughs> clearly like it's, it's so hard to quantify a what makes a successful film these days. Who knows how these companies are extracting value out of these movies? I know, for example, Ninja Turtles made like, what, $100 million domestically in box office and sold $1 billion worth of toys. So did it under like, so I mean, it, it just goes to show like, you know, these studios, like, those are conjectures. People like to latch on to trends and try to point out little trends and and none of them hold up because then one thing will happen and it will completely destroy the trend. And they'll all be like, oh, uh, everyone's saying that family films aren't great and then not doing well and then Spider-Verse makes a billion dollars and everyone says, like, no one wants a female-led comedy and then Barbie makes a billion dollars. <laughs> like, it, it, it just, there, there, there is no... You know, people like good movies. People get excited when good movies come out. People like to be a part of a cultural conversation. If everyone's talking about something, they want to talk about it too. Um, if they see something they relate to, if they see something that is exciting, they go see it. And 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 there are very few movies that tick all those boxes that, that fail, you know? Uh, it doesn't happen that often. I'd say more so um, those movies do well and uh, at least well enough like that they make more of them you know um and so it, 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 i don't think that that's accurate and and i you know have i do so many interviews where people are throwing like their big theory is like what the new trend and what what state of hollywood we are currently in and it is impossible to to predict where we are going and it is even hard to contextualize where we are currently are for like until a few years from now, basically. And you see with Marvel, those movies, like everything mm. and changes, you know? And so um, I don't put much like stock, you know, I, I don't put much personally in any of these trends, you know, and, and people hypothesizing like good movies prevail, period, you know? And the more of them that are out there, the more people go to theaters. And even ones that seem like maybe they didn't prevail, usually find an audience over time and will prevail and 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 will will find their place you know i like so it, it's hard to contextualize a movie even the year it comes out i find and seth i totally agree i mean like there's so many there's there are so many variables and layers to this um, um but it's funny because when elemental first came out it you know, it underperformed in a way that I could only see very myopically. I was only seeing it in terms of how it was quantified out there. And uh, um, uh, in, in terms of getting wrapped up with that, um, it's an emotional thing, you know, uh, to, to see it in that sort of view, right? But then as, as you know, we had a miracle for us, but like the film through word of mouth was connecting with people. And then it just hits you again to exactly what you said, Seth, like, it's the idea that audiences are connecting. However they're connecting to it, that they're connecting to a film, you know, is what it's all for, you know? And uh, uh, the idea of it being in a theater or being in streaming or in someone's pocket in their iPhone, you're working your ass off and putting all your heart into this stuff so that it could one day chemically reach out to an audience member and uh, spark something that I, it's just, they're just, I've gone all those different paths and ultimately, you know, it just boils down to that. Yeah. I mean, that, there's that great old quote, like no, in by Hollywood, no one knows anything. Right. And yet everyone acts like they know everything. I mean, yeah. I get, I get particularly frustrated by some of these trend things because they selectively omit things that don't, validate their thesis exactly you know? yeah. so the thing there's always the a selective <laughs> omission this is apparently like no one wants to see any superhero movies but not just us but guardians of the galaxy volume three did pretty damn well too with superheroes so it's like they don't want to just say look it has to just be a good movie that connects to an audience that excites people 
And that's something that can't be bought. That's something that can't be plotted out. You never know. I, I think all last year was that no one wanted to go to a movie theater to see an adult drama over two hours. And Oppenheimer made like a billion dollars almost. Um, yeah. and, and I sat in a theater and people were riveted. So it's like, did, I don't know. It's just, there's this selective. It's true. I was, I was a part of so many conversations. They were like, Oh, the prestige adult drama is dead. No one's yeah. going to <laughs> it anymore. like, that's not true. It's, no, it's no. Not true. I mean, it's, look, I, yeah. I write theater play play theater has been dying for thousands of years and yet people still go to Broadway plays and, and go to the West end. So uh, yeah, I, I agree with what they're saying. It's just, it, it's, 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 it's it's really fun. I'm in the middle of this Capra, uh, Frank Capra uh, bio, and uh, literally when sound came to Hollywood, the conversations that he was talking about having is so eerily similar constantly of this cycle of everyone trying to figure out where Hollywood is going and what will entice an audience. And ultimately, it's the same equation of just trying to tell a good story mm -hmm. next. It's, it's really funny. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no prognosticator got Barbie right. I didn't see a single prognosticator about how big Barbie was going to be that was even close. No, people were <laughs> dropping out of that movie. They wanted nothing to do with it. Yeah. Did you give me hope, though, when, when animate, animated titles did really well in theater? Because to me, that speaks to how, how far reached this medium could be, right? Because some people were like, oh, animations are for kids. Animations are for everyone. Mm -hmm. So when it, it does well, I'm like, yes, go. Because you know, we're all friends in the industry. And I, I it... I feel like this year it gave me a lot of hope. To what extent is current box office, in your opinion, affected by, since the pandemic, obviously this rise of streaming? Nimona, for example, was primarily streaming. I can speak to that. But when we started Nimona, we were theatrical. We were a theatrical film. And our movie is huge. It's got huge scale. It's got these epic scenes. So at first, like truly, when we became a streaming film, we were it was an adjustment for us. And at first we were a little like, oh, that's different. That's not what we set out to do. But Nimona, like Nimona has LGBTQ plus characters. We have a gay relationship. And if we went theatrical, there are box offices, like there are markets that would not screen our movie. Mm -hmm. and we released Nimona. We got to make this movie and not compromise any of that. We made it authentic and true to what we wanted to. And our movie went to 190, 190 countries at once. And people got to choose to see it. So there's the box office. That's one measure of success. And we made a film for a big screen. But our movie got to be received by anybody who needed it immediately around the world. And that is very cool and very powerful. And we don't have box office numbers to look back to, but we're, we have how people are connecting with the film. And people have come up to us. We were lucky enough, we got to screen the movie with certain people, with, with different audiences and hear the reactions. Because that's the other side of streaming. You don't get to go to a theater and sit with 300 strangers and have them like feel how they're reacting to your movie. But we we go out as much as we can to screen this for people. And we're getting some stories that are, I'm going to get emotional, that are truly that, that matter. So putting putting these films and making movies that we care about and just getting them to audiences, that's why we're doing this. We had someone came and shared the story with us that this movie, they, they showed it to their parents and their parents finally had a language to be able to talk to them about their gender expression that they didn't have before. And they thanked us uh, for bringing their parents back to them. And that's just one story. So that's something that's very personal to us. But I think I think the industry is changing, but it's not lessening the impact of, of these films. And our reach is only getting bigger. Sometimes just reviews and no box office is the, the greatest thing that an artist can hope for. <laughs> There's been times, I, I, yeah, plenty of times, like, just give me the reviews, keep the money. <laughs> so it is it is still a business. What's driving your companies and their decisions about you know what to go to the box office <laughs> for and what they need to make at the box office versus going to a streaming platform? But that's the only difference that we have in France is Production-wise, we have this chance of having a system where every cinema ticket has a little tax that's taken from it that will go to French cinema, which allows, you know, like, for example, when, I don't know, like Avengers Endgame makes like a, a lot of success in France, that's going to be a part of the money that will go to French movies, which is great, you know, like for us, because we can do movies and we don't care if it's going to be a success or not, which is not great, but I mean, at least we can experiment a lot in France and... And me coming from this philosophy, you know, of, of cinema, because 
I, I think no French animation movie is ever, uh, I don't know how you say the word, you know, when you give money to make the movie, but you don't have enough money to, you know, like to- Under budgeted? Get... Yeah, well, this kind of, yeah, exactly. And and the, and basically, um, you know, we even if it's not working, if a movie is not working, we keep doing it. That doesn't mean that's a problem. Ernest and Celestin was, you know, like I think 10 million euros budget. And I don't think we reach or we barely reach, you know, like 10 million box office uh, for the movie. But we keep doing movies because we have this system. So that's a great chance that we have. And, and we're sort of like trying to protect it at all costs. But but just I, I just wanted to throw my little French thing into the mix. So, so are any of your studios rethinking your theatrical strategies? I think the theatrical experience, the communal experience of being able to experience something, you know, the emotions, the, the jokes play is better, the emotions heightened. And I don't think that's something that is ever going to go away. And speaking from, I've just been traveling for two weeks all over Europe and be able to go to the screenings with the audience and the, the excitement, the energy I felt, I feel like that is not something you get from watching at home. And it's something that, you know, will never go away. Are you saying that Disney animation has not changed its strategy or is not looking to change its strategy with regard to theatrical releases? Yeah, this is a studio where, you know, they <laughs> it's made Snow White. And people at the time doubt if, if people are gonna come see this feature length animated film or not, and they did right, and and that revolutionized the industry. And and I can't speak for the company, but I'm just speaking from my own, you know, thoughts and, and passion. I'm like the, the the theatrical feature. I think is here to stay. Um, Jeffrey Katzenberg recently predicted that generative AI will drastically cut the cost of making animated movies, uh, as well as the number of artists making these movies. Um, what is everybody's thoughts on this topic? You know, have, having seen <laughs> some AI uh, artwork that's been created, yeah, there are a lot of really sort of mind blowing um, um, aspects to the recombination of different ideas, you know, and uh, um, I, I can clearly see tools that can help the process, you know, as, you know, there's so many parts of animation that are painstaking and really, you know, labor intensive. And uh, I definitely feel like there's a world where the generative AI can help with that, you know, processing dialogue or rework, you know, like anything that just takes for everything, there's a, a, a benefit to that in terms of artwork, that's still been a tough thing. I, I still haven't seen some new idea that's come out of AI that's been like, oh, that's sparking something for me. And uh, maybe there is a day where that's happening, you know, uh, with the, you know, automated generative AI where they, you know, they'll start thinking on their own. But at this point, uh, I, I, I definitely see the value of it as a tool, but not something that's going to create something new. I agree with that. I think as artists, like our industry is constantly changing and technology is always going to keep evolving and we evolve with it. But the human side, the the emotion that we put into the films, I don't see that being replaced. There's ways to, I hope things get easier. I hope things get more approachable and that more accessible so more people can tell stories. If we can get all different types of films and more of them out there, but I don't see replacement happening. I don't think that takes away the creativity that artists bring. Yeah, I don't, I don't see how you could replace it and still call it animation, to be honest. Like I had a conversation with someone once where they didn't realize that animation never is mocap, you know? And, and it's like when you sit in dailies, um, you're actually, animators are giving you different physical performances. <laughs> you have the, we, we talk a lot about the vocal performance, but then the animator will actually do a physical emotional performance get notes, go back and then deliver with the same voice, a completely different performance. I think, I really think that, I, I just can't see how that human aspect can can really be replaced. I, I just see it, I, I, who, I cannot predict how the, what these tools are gonna be and how they're gonna be used. But I think at its core, animation is human beings. <laughs> you know? by, art by definition is yeah. human expression, you yeah. know? So, <laughs> It, it just isn't art anymore. It's something else, you know, and, and not to say like, you know, when I was a kid, they had screensavers that were really pretty. No one was like printing it out and putting it on their wall, you know, like it, it, it's because it it didn't speak to them. It wasn't, you know, when something is is art and when something isn't, you know, and and things made by computers are not art because they are not expressive of any person's experience, taste, 
passion, fear, anything, you know, they are, they are, they are generated. They're not expressed. And I think, I think think point of view is important when you tell a story and point of view can only come from human experience. And I love to think that we're too chaotic for computer to guess what, (laughs) you know, what, what will come from our minds that makes it unique. And we work with a lot of great tools, especially in CGI movies. Right. And for example, like you can, you can have computer generate how the cave would move. But when we look at it, I'm like, okay, realistically, when you have a wind like that, the cave of, you know, this character will move this way. But with the story, with what's going on on the frame, we want to break away from that reality just to accentuate the emotions of what we want to tell. And that comes from having great human eyes everywhere, nitpicking every single frame. And people don't understand how many, how many people get involved in these films. And how mm-hmm. much like you you stress over how a palm tree will sway in the wind in this space of frame? Does it tell our story? There's, there's so much artistry going into these. And I don't want to be naive about it. I mean, I know it's beginning to take jobs away already. And, and it's this idea of, you know, you know, AI is gonna take your job away. I mean, there is a reality to it, but I assume like. But it's it's not that AI will take your job. I assume it's going to be that it's going to take the people's job. It'll take people's jobs away that don't know AI. I feel like it is something that you have to sort of understand uh, to a certain degree. But you know, the, I don't know if any of you heard of you know, you know, Elon Musk's you know deal book summit uh, in, in New York and sort of his fear and apprehension of 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 where AI can go. I mean, there's a reality there that, you know, maybe in the, you know, in like five years, there'll be all these AI robots laughing at this video, you know, like, (laughs) what did they know? And it's just going to happen. But um, as long as they're laughing, they're potential audience members. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. Yeah. (laughs) Do they pay money for tickets? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Through their neural link, they'll just, yeah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Do they like toys? (laughs) You know, is it, you know, the the next generation that's going to be most affected? And if so, you know, how how does, you know, how do you train the next generation? I, I can't see uh, being a Luddite will help. I feel like it, you have to, um, 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 with parameters, understand it and, uh, um, um, and then uh, allow those tools to be integrated so that the next generation can find ways to use it to better tell their, you know, their, their stories, you know. Uh, but, but I also think it's like, it is defying it, you know? And I think people are interested when you defy the perfection right, of right. technology. And right. I mean, again, this movie is like, I mean, you know, Kemp, you know, like it, it, with Ninja Turtles, honestly, so much of the animation process was not letting the computers make the stuff look yeah. like as perfect yeah. as they wanted to and and messing up the lines and the symmetry and the borders and 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 the you know and breaking the perfection that a computer was trying to impose on it because it's not interesting. Yeah. Uh, and imperfection is far more interesting than perfection, you know, and and imperfection speaks to expression. And 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 that's what, you know, when as again, so like I, I just saw firsthand as we were making this film that so much time and energy went into not doing what the computers wanted us to do and creating mm-hmm. a system that was diverging from the computer's desired path for the look of the animation and the movement and all this stuff. Um, and actually you know, bringing, you know, disrupting its process. So uh, to me, all that speaks, this is the most technologically advanced movie I've been a part of. And the fact that so much energy went into negating the desires of the technology and imposing our human touch to it, I think speaks to the fact that, that the work computers do just isn't interesting without people really modulating it and, and, and doing it, you know, and, and, and creating it, you know. It's just the, the, the choice of the artist, right? Remember when like HD came out and it was supposed to be the end of film? How many movies do you see that are still shot on film? You know, I remember watching Oppenheimer and seeing the cigarette burns in the corner and I'm going like, okay, so film ain't going anywhere. You know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) there's always going to be artists that that are going to make choices that, that, that just best represent their artistic vision. 
Well, yeah. all of these films are completely different styles. Yeah. And all like that just shows we're all taking the technology and using it. We're not fighting against it. We're using it for what we want to do and to tell the stories that we want to tell. Mm -hmm. And as for the next generation, they're so much more tech savvy than we are anyway. And like, we are very tech savvy. This is our industry. But so I'm not worried about them using the tools. I think what we need to keep encouraging is them to tell the stories that matter to them. And I think we're going to get even cooler looks and crazier stories and, and better adventures because of this, because we're not limited anymore. Yeah. I just hope they're telling it in movies, yeah. not on TikTok. And, uh, <laughs> uh, broadly speaking, um, uh, where do we go from here? What what do you see as the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity for the animation industry? Expense. I think the cost is really, especially at least with theatrical, you know, these aren't cheap movies and the, the metric of success, um, it can be so high when um, a film costs this much. I think that, you know, some of these big animated films, including several of us here, you know, our, our films budget wise or, you know, if, if they were live action, you'd be talking about how huge the 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 budget is. And I think sometimes I, I would just love to see more smaller films with smaller budgets, figuring out ways to do it that can that that you're able to take even greater risk. I just I just think that it's uh, it's hard to sustain stuff that's that's always so expensive and trying to figure out ways to do it that's less expensive. But that's just one of my little things. I've had the exact opposite problem my entire career. I've only been able to make inexpensive movies. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would love it if my issue was I had too much money and too much financial <laughs> pressure as a result of it. Um, I'm currently, I'm making an $8 million animated movie right now. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all hand drawn so it's it's different you know but yeah. it is uh it's, it's a black and white hand drawn animated drama um, uh -huh. uh, and so it's obviously very different but um yeah to me the biggest challenge is make is 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 does this younger generation actually like movies and are movies the thing that they are that is their prevailing source of entertainment and therefore their go-to source of expression. Like when I was young, we were all obsessed with movies. That was it. Everyone was a part of every cultural, there was a monoculture when it came to film basically, you know? Um, and now that's not the case. There are huge movies that a lot of people never see. And there are a lot of groups of teenagers and kids who just don't see movies at all. Um, and instead they, they go on social media, they go, they, they watch reruns of friends on Netflix. Like they, they, they just don't, the idea of sitting somewhere for two hours and not being able to look at your phone, I honestly think is to me, one of the things that we are up against the most. Mm -hmm. And I, to me, that is why the theatrical experience is so special to me. It's because you are telling people they can't look at their phone while they watch your movie. And that's one of the only big, like there is a communal experience, but that's also a big thing is mm -hmm. I do it. I'll be watching a movie and find myself looking at the phone, but if you're in a theater, you're not allowed to. And I think to me, that is a challenge but it's also what I love about film, but it is also when I look at the younger generation, I don't, they don't look at movies the same way we do, you know, or, or did when we were growing up. And I think that's why it was important for us to make a movie that teenagers related to and that we quote to each other. I know people who work in uh, teachers in high schools and they're saying like the kids for the first time are quoting a movie in class and they're yelling lines from Ninja Turtles at the teachers and they're yelling bacon, egg and cheese at the teachers and they're, they're yelling, lob it up, lob it up. And 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 so to give kids a cultural touchstone, a communal thing that makes them love, love movies, to me was very important because, yeah, the thing that keeps me up at night is like, will teenagers just stop wanting to make movies? Will they, will they, will they have another thing by the time they're in their 20s, you know? The movie going experience, I think, is going to, it's going to just keep getting better i hope people have more choices now which means that they can choose what they're going to see and that means stuff will break through when it matters and i love that like that's such an exciting moment that we're in right now we have these options and beautiful things are rising to the top because people truly want them mm -hmm. they're not limited to, i can only go see these things that are out this weekend they can do anything and we're getting such incredible stuff out of that and i think it's inspiring people to do even more i think so what's actually have... very heartening though is that like even David Zaslav has acknowledged that like just putting a movie on streaming is not one iota as valuable as releasing a movie in theaters and then putting it on screening, uh, on streaming because a 
theatrical marketing campaign is what gives a movie cultural relevance before anyone has seen it, you know? And that is something that is, you know, hard to replace. And and I actually think that a lot of studios like streaming because it generally means you don't have to give it a theatrical marketing campaign and it's just less expensive. And I think that to me, the ideal version is that movies, everyone will have an, every opportunity to see the movies in theaters and then they will go to streaming in a way that if they missed it in theaters or they couldn't, they couldn't make time or couldn't afford it. They could, they could see it on streaming, you know? And, and I think that that would be in my, if I could write how Hollywood works, that's what I would chase. I think the marketing campaigns could be for either. Cause like Leo just came out on Netflix and that, that a huge campaign and a ton of reach and it didn't have a box office, but people saw it. And I think that I think if they're willing to actually put a big theatrical level marketing campaign behind a streaming movie, that would be amazing. But I'd say mm. they barely they they from my experience do it to maybe like one ordained one every quarter. <laughs> the, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> you, got but, you got the one. <laughs> like we didn't have that type of campaign. And we still broke through. People are talking about our movie and they're seeing it. And we're we're fighting against that. Like we're pushing forward, but it's happening because they're resonating. The story's resonating with people. Yeah, I think it's great. And it's amazing yeah. when that happens. And I think that like uh, the more that luck was stacked in your favor and the deck was stacked in your mm -hmm. favor, the less of a, an accomplishment it would be. And I think that's how it should be is if you made a great film, it shouldn't be up to you to fight for the audience's attention. It should be up to the studio to pay to get the audience's attention. Fully totally agree. And um, <laughs> like, I, I, yeah, it could be an interesting future, but I like that we have more options now. Yeah, and I like that your movie exists, which it wouldn't without this current infrastructure, you know? The world needs it. Like the world needs these stories. And I do think, I think we need more representation on screen and behind screen. So it's not as hard to get films like this to the world because people want them and they they are universal. They're not niche. And I just wish, I hope this movie takes a little step to push the industry or a big step if we can towards a more open world. Are you seeing more representation behind the camera as well? Yes, I think we all, are. I mean, I hope I can speak for all of us. I've definitely seen more throughout my career now, but it's still not where it needs to be. Um, every film on screen on this screen is doing a lot to push that forward. So I just hope we keep inspiring more people to step up and that we also bring people with us as everyone here is in a position of power to do that and to make change. Yeah, I, th I kind of think I am representation. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> some people call me that by mistake. They say, hey, representation. Hey, you should change your name, no. the yeah. name on the Zoom window to representation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not. I don't mean to be flippant. But, uh, no, it, but it is. I mean, look, the the pipelines improved a lot. I mean, look, the the field of animation. I, I, I mean, if you look back 30, 40 years ago to to art schools like Art Center and Sheridan and up in Canada and stuff like that, it was it was very monolithic, you know. And now you're seeing a, a lot of different people coming out of these schools. Um, a lot of story artists of all ethnicities all over the world, both gen all genders. And, and I think it's starting to filter in and then filter up to, to leadership positions. But I think we're already seeing with the, the films that have kind of risen to the top that people have latched onto this year, um, the, the, the end result of that work that has actually been, been being done um, behind the scenes for, for a little while. Yeah, when, when I started off as a storyboard artist, I was the only woman in any production for such a long time. And I remember asking someone when I was younger, thinking about going into animations, I was like, do girls even work in this industry? <laughs> and I was like, maybe girls don't read comic book as much as my I do. That's a <laughs> comment to make. And uh, when I got to uh, work on Frozen, and it was startling to, <laughs> to be able to discuss like, what is love to the, these two women character, right? And having um, women writer and director, Jennifer Lee, that was like, I didn't think that would make a change, but the change was very big and, and effective mm -hmm. on me sitting in that story room, be able to openly talk about this without having to feel like you're the only representation, no voice here, that you're not the only one. And by the time I got to Raya and there were more women in the room talking about the, the friendship between two female characters in the way that we don't have to be precious about it anymore. We can be more real. I think that bring truth into the story room. And I have been head of story and I love putting together a team from people from all walks of life because then they can 
discuss, you know, that we no longer have to only reference Star Wars and Indiana Jones, which are two movies that I love, but <laughs> you get like a dollar every time someone bring up those reference, I would be so rich right now. I feel like with um, technology where it is now and where it's going, right, the world just open up to whatever story you want to tell, you no longer are limited to the style or certain pipeline that 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 you have to tie to anymore. So I'm excited that going forward, you have so much creative freedom in the way that maybe that's a challenge too. So because you can make anything, the point of view has to be more solid and, and inventive and you cannot just rely on things that has been done. Well, I think it's great also that like the, I think when I was coming up, especially like CG animation kind of had one look to it. It was like a yeah. clean, very clean look. And it wasn't necessarily always servicing uh, the narrative, you know what I mean? And so to be able to define the look through the narrative and the theme, um, you know, that to me was something that felt very new and current and like an opportunity. The idea that you know, we could take this like teenage idea in Ninja Turtles and apply it to how it looked literally and the animation and the color and the style and all of that, you know, and to make it look like a teenager drew it, like it, it was a, a perfect combination of visuals and theme and story, which to me is something that animation like really offers you. I've made so many live action movies. You cannot control every element like that. And, and, I remember honestly looking at the first stuff with Ninja Turtles and being like, will they let us do this? Like, is this, it's so divergent from what the norm is. Like, is this even allowed? Will they just say no? And and they didn't, they said, yes, go for it. I think because it would have taken too long to change it at that point. <laughs> and they had a release date to hit. But um, it, 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 I think that is an exciting opportunity is creatively the powers that be seem to have loosened their definition of what an animated film looks like and is allowing, you know, uh, people, people like all of us are allowed to make things that have a look that serves their theme and story that that is not, you know, subscribing to a, a, a kind of standardized look, you know. Yeah, it's funny that just to, defend, just to defend teenagers for a quick second, I have to, full disclosure, one scene in our film that got the biggest laugh was actually animated by a 14-year-old. Oh, yeah, the Lego one, That's, right? Yeah, yeah, the Lego yeah, part. Right. It's so like funny. <laughs> this was a lot of fun. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. It was, uh, I'm, I'm really glad you were all able to participate in the conversation. Glad Thank you so much, Carolyn. This it's was nice fun. meeting everybody. Um, yeah. It was so fun. Appreciate it. Nice to meet everybody. Well, nice big fan. I'm, I'm, oh, if you need a voice, let me know. I do a lot of them.